It's Tuesday, 2 p.m. on the ROM Toronto Instagram account. That must mean it's the ROM Kids Show. Uh, thank you for hanging out with us, for all our regular families at home. What's going on? Nice to see you. To all the classrooms tuning in, what's going on? Nice to see you as well. Uh, hope everyone's staying safe uh, and doing, uh, doing as well as they can during these, uh, during these times. Very excited to be with you today. We're talking about winter birds uh, with ornithologist, friend of the show, returning Mark Peck uh, is here with us today to talk about winter birds. We're going to spend some time talking about penguins, maybe even see a penguin. Um, so we're going to have a lot of fun with that. Uh, what did we do last week? We had paleontologist Ashley Reynolds on, which was super cool. Um, and we have even more cool guests coming up. Uh, Kim Tate, Dr. Kim Tate will be joining us in a few weeks to talk about all the cool missions taking place on Mars. Um, and also, Happy Martian New Year today. Uh, it is the start of a new year on Mars, so that's cool. Lots of fun stuff happening. Uh, we're about to start. I'm getting a note um, from our end here, but I'm very excited. Oh, we got three classrooms. That's very exciting. Uh, if you're joining us, drop your name, drop your room number into the chat. Would love to be able to hang with you and get ready to talk about birds, okay? So all your bird questions can drop into the chat. Because it's a bird episode, I'm wearing my dinosaur socks. Um, as we know, um, birds are dinosaurs. And so when you have like those chicken tendies, you are eating a dinosaur chicken finger right there. And I think with that, I think we're ready to go to the theme song portion of the event. And then it's Mark Peck and Bird Feeders. Welcome to the ROM Kids Show with me. We'll do some crafts and tell some stories. Let's talk about science, art, and history. Welcome to the ROM Kids Show, starring you, you and me. There we go. That's the theme song portion of the event. It's time to move on over to the art table to get ready to talk about our uh, bird episode today. Let's put that one right on down here and talk about everything we need. Ah, oh, Kelly Holloway, nice to see you again. What's going on? Good to see you, friend. All right, so we are making bird feeders today and we're making citrus themed bird feeders. So try and find, of all the things that you need for your household, try and find some sort of citrus, okay? So we got a mandarini right here, mandarini. Um, or you can get like an orange or a grapefruit. Um, today I will be using a lemon because mandarinis are too important in our household. We cannot be juicing them or making our projects out of them. They must be consumed and eaten. So instead I will be juicing and making a bird feeder out of a lemon. So you're gonna wanna grab that. Uh, very important today as well, we will be using um, a knife to cut our citrus. So get a trusted adult in your household, um, or if you're doing this in class, like get your teacher, um, to make sure that you are doing this safely, okay? Safety is key. It is always just as important as fun, because together, that's how you have a great time, okay? What else? I have a cutting board to do my cutting on. Um, I have rope to make my um, bird feeder, like to hang it from a tree. Um, and then grab any sort of like bird feed, okay? We don't have bird feed in our household. So today, today for us, we will be using all sorts of nuts, okay? Uh, grab a juicer of some sort so that you can hollow out the inside of your uh, citrus. And with that, while you're grabbing everything, oh, and a skewer. And all of this will make sense in a second as we go through the project. Um, so grab all your objects, get what you need, get prepared. And while you're doing that, let's introduce our special guest. Whoa! It's Mark Pack. What's going on? Hey, Karen, how are you? Uh, it's good to have you back. Uh, long time viewers of the show might remember Mark Peck was here when we talked about passenger pigeons, which was a great episode. And remember, we're live uh, on Instagram on Tuesdays at 2, like right now. But you can also find our episodes up on YouTube, okay? So you can go back and watch any of the old ones. We had an awesome episode talking about passenger pigeons. And it was in that episode we learned that the dodo bird is a member 
of, of the pigeon family along with passenger pigeons. So that was really, really cool. We loved that. Um, I want to do the first step of our project with our friends and then we're going to start talking about birds and specifically winter birds. And again, if you have questions, throw them into the group chat and we're going to ask our expert. we got an expert here with us, the Royal Ontario Museum's ornithologist, great friend, uh, Mark Peck. Okay, so while you're getting prepared, while you're getting your questions and all that, let's do our first step of our um, project right here. So again, safely, what you're gonna do is you're gonna cut your citrus in half. And what's really good about this project is it's like pretty biodegradable. So you can just sort of leave it up there and then it's just gonna get consumed back up by the earth. So I'm just gonna cut my, the steps that I'm going to do while we're doing our conversation with Mark off the bat is I'm going to cut my lemon in half. I'm then gonna juice my lemon and then I'm gonna tell you the next steps, okay? So Mark, thanks for being here. I like when I think about winter birds, the bird that most comes to my mind um, are penguins. Because in my mind, penguins are in the Antarctic uh, with the emperor penguins. It's all really cold and it's icy and it's snowy. So I thought we'd start our winter bird adventure talking about penguins. And my first question for you is how do they survive? Like, how do they do it? It's so cold and so icy. Okay, so first of all, there's actually 18 different types of penguins. And although some of them live in the Antarctic, there's actually this, there's one species called the Galapagos penguin that lives on the equator. So it's not even in the southern hemisphere. It actually is over in the northern hemisphere. But the way they do it is feathers are great insulators. And if you think about it, if you have a duvet on your bed, that's stuffed with down and feathers, that's what birds get too. Think about how a black capped chickadee can spend all winter long outside in and around Toronto, and all it has is those feathers, a little bit of fat, and hopefully a lot of food energy to keep it going all the time. Huh, that's interesting. So these, they got, whoa, sorry about that. So penguins can live in the cold because they got like their fat and they got their feathers and that keeps them warm. Yeah, and they have a faster energy or metabolism than we do, so it keeps them a little bit warmer, as long as they get enough food. Okay, one of the interesting things you said is, I thought that penguins only lived in the Antarctic, but they live all over the world, but they only live in like the Southern Hemisphere, right? Almost all of them live in the Southern Hemisphere, and they come in all different sizes. So I went into the collection today and got one of our penguins out of the collection drawer. And this one's called a little blue penguin or a fairy penguin. And it's the smallest of the penguins. It's only about one foot tall or 0.3 meters. And it lives most of the time in New Zealand and Australia when it's not in the ocean. Huh, okay, so that's like a, a penguin that you can hold. But I have a, a picture of an emperor penguin here. How big are those? So emperor penguins are about a meter in, in height. <coughs> okay, a so meter yeah, in height, that's, very like a, tall. that's like a kid size. That's kid size. Huh, huh, okay, so penguins don't just live in the South, uh, in the South Pole, they live in warm uh, areas as well. Some are really, really small, some are like kid sized. Um, I have a question about penguins and like, they have wings? And they can flap their penguins wings, do have, but they don't fly. Penguins do have wings. You can see them. They don't fly, but they actually kind of fly underwater. So most birds don't use their wings when they're underwater. Penguins actually use their wings like paddles, and it helps them move faster through the water. So penguins fly, but underwater instead of in the air. Oh, that's a really good way of putting it, that penguins, they don't fly in the air, but they fly underwater because they're so speedy. Uh, I have a, we have a lot of questions about what do birds eat here, especially from one of our classrooms. Thanks you for chiming in. Um, what do penguins eat? Uh, most of the time, penguins eat fish or small shrimp-like invertebrates that they can get underwater. So they're not eating on land. They're almost always eating in the water itself, and mainly fish. Okay, so then building on that, 
penguins eat mostly fish. Do birds overall just eat fish? They eat a lot of different things, right? Birds eat almost everything that's edible. They're, some of them are omnivores. Some of them just eat meat. Some of them just eat vegetables and seeds. Some of them will eat bananas. It all depends on what species you're talking about. So a lot of species are very, very flexible in what they eat. Some are kind of fussy. Yeah, I think like pigeons, they'll eat just about anything that they can find. Yeah, penguin, or pigeons are pretty good at eating just about anything, especially the ones in the city. Yeah, our Toronto-based pet pigeons. Um, okay, so I've juiced my um, my lemon here, and so you can see it's built sort of like a bowl, right? It's a bowl that we can put things into, we can put our bird feed into. So that's your first step. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my skewer to poke a hole in the side a little bit lower so that people can, so that it won't break. Like if you, if you put it too near the top, then it will just rip, okay? So you wanna make it strong, put your hole a little bit lower, and then you're gonna do it the same on the opposite side as well. And then I'm gonna take some string and I'm gonna pull them together. Okay, um, we're gonna go to some questions from our audience right now, because we have a lot. So I'm gonna drift from my script a little bit here, but how, do, okay, so why does a penguin live in cold water? Like, why would it want to live near cold water and with all the cold? You know, most of the time, birds and mammals live where they can get food. Hmm. Penguins evolved in cold water. There's a lot of food. There's a lot of fish and invertebrates in cold water. So they stayed there, and they've evolved to actually live quite happily in cold water. That's a really good question, because, like, we would think, like, oh, my gosh, we wouldn't want to live in the cold like that but we can. Um, oh, this is another great question. How long can a penguin stay underwater? Uh, well, that varies depending on the penguin, but certainly a couple of minutes anyway. Penguins are really good divers and swimmers, and because they have to chase food, it's important that they do stay underwater. So I'm not sure the exact length of time, but at least a couple of minutes and a lot longer than you and I would want to try and stay under cold water for. Yeah, when it's that cold, I couldn't do it. Okay, why are why is there such diversity in height in penguins? That's an interesting question. I think just because penguins have found different habitats, they take advantage of different food resources. So some penguins might feed on bigger fish, other penguins might feed on smaller fish. They might feed in different areas. So they became isolated and became different species. Hmm. So it depends really on your habitat, where you're growing up, and what you're eating. We do have a fun question here. Because sometimes we have birds as pets. Would a penguin be a good pet? I don't think a penguin would be a good pet. It would be pretty hard to house train. And you would need a big pool for them. If you really want to see a penguin, go out into the wild where they live, or maybe go to some zoos that also have penguins that look after them properly. It's pretty hard to take care of a, a bird like a penguin. Okay, I think this is our final penguin question before we continue on. But okay. how long do penguins live? Yeah, some of them would probably go 25, 30 years. Whoa! Um, yeah, if, if they can find enough food, and there's no predators attacking them, they can live a long time. That's fascinating. 30 years is like really long. Like some cats can get like close to 20, but like a like a 30 year old penguin, that's kind of fun for me. Um, okay, let's consider some birds a bit closer to home. And so uh, for everyone, like our show is hosted in Toronto where the Royal Ontario Museum is. And something that I'm really used to seeing is birds going south in the winter. Why do birds go south in the winter? What's going on with that? Well, it's pretty much the same answer all the time when you wonder where birds are. It's usually about the food. So birds want to follow their food. And we get a lot of birds in the summer because we have a lot of insects like mosquitoes and moths that birds like to eat. In the fall and winter, when it gets colder, the insects all disappear, and so the birds have to find new food. The only way they can do that is by moving south. So some of them go maybe to just New York. Some of them go all the way down to the tropics in South America. 
And there's even a couple that go all the way down to the Antarctic, like the Arctic turn. What? Mike, it's from the Arctic to the Antarctic. Wow. Okay, so there's a bird that goes all the way across the globe. It starts in the Arctic and goes, so it starts in the North Pole, goes to the South Pole, and then does it again every year? And then comes back, and he, they just keep doing it back and forth. That's awesome. Um, okay, that's my big fact that we're gonna take away today. Okay, we do have a really uh, good question here that's sort of related to like, how come pe uh, penguins have different sizes? One of our friends at, uh, one of our friends online is asking us, why do birds overall have so many different sizes and so many different bodies? Well, because they, they've evolved over thousands and millions of years to take advantage of different resources or they got isolated in different geographic areas or countries and they found they could specialize on certain foods mm. and they just slowly evolved and changed over time. So we have almost, we have a little over 10,000 different species of birds in the world today. 10,000. Uh, one thing I, I'm, I'm really taking away today is that food is really important to the ways that animals live their lives. It's important to where they live during the year. You know, you change different parts of where you live based on your food. And it also changes the way that you live or maybe the way that your body works because we can look at a hummingbird and we can look at like a penguin and those are two very, very different sizes. Yeah, they really are. And, and each of them has special adaptations that they can use to help find food, to look after their young, and migrate if they have to. So it's pretty cool. Some will feed on fish, and hummingbirds feed on nectar and sugars. That's, that's so cool. They have such a diversity of foods that they eat. Okay, when birds, oh, this is such a good question we just got from our online audience. When birds migrate, do they make homes, like new homes along the way? They don't make a new nest along the way, but they find a habitat that they like with lots of food and they'll stay in that, they might stay in that same area for two weeks on the way down. But on the way north in the spring, when they're coming back up to nest, they actually go a lot faster because they really get excited about coming up here and nesting as quickly as possible. So a lot of our Canadian birds, although we call them our birds, they don't actually stay in Canada very long. They come in in May, and they're gone by September and the rest of the time they're in their winter home or migrating back and forth. Yeah, they got a motor to get back north so that they can have, uh, they can lay their eggs. Um, Ms. White's class wants to know, um, how do birds make those eggs? How do birds make eggs? Yeah. This is well, a big question. Have... <laughs> so all females, birds and mammals have eggs inside their bodies. Yeah. The difference is with birds, they actually form a calcium shell around the egg and then they lay that egg out into a nest or somewhere where they can sort of sit on it and help incubate it until the young hatches out of the egg. You know, all life has a lot of different, sim has a lot of similarities and eggs being one of them, but you know, sort of different in how they function. Um, okay, we have some, we have a lot, Thank you. We're having a very uh, engaging chat going on today with all these bird questions. And I know both Mark and I love it because we love talking about birds. Um, okay, I do have a question from my questions. Um, we sort of talked about this before, like birds, how do birds stay warm? And birds stay warm in the winter because they have fat on their bodies which insulates them along with their feathers. But I have a question specifically about ducks. And ducks are my favorite type of bird because they can fly, they can waddle, and they can swim. Ducks are awesome. They're so uniquely suited for multiple types of ways to live. But I see ducks in Lake Ontario in the middle of the winter, and they're just like waddling their little legs, swimming through the water. How? It seems so, so, so cold because on their legs, there's no feathers. Yeah, I know. D ducks are amazing. And it's not just ducks, it's swans and geese all spend a lot of time with their feet in the water. 
what they've done is they've evolved their feet that they have something called a, a cross current mechanism where blood from the arteries goes down and it's nice and warm and then as blood is coming up it gets warmed up a little bit and they have a way of constricting the blood flow into their feet so that there's not a lot of blood going down there and it never freezes so they've evolved to actually live quite happily in the water and don't forget when it's minus 20 in the air if they're on open water it's over 32 degrees or zero celsius so it's not really that cold for them hmm. interesting interesting we sort of identified that my, my some of my favorite birds are um ducks but our friends uh online want to know mark what's your favorite bird my favorite bird that's a good question it changes every year. I like owls a lot. I like common loons. And if you don't know what a common loon is, that's the same bird that's on your, your $1 piece, your, your loony. So loons are kind of my favorite, but I, I often get a kick out of owls and, and other birds too. I like all birds. I spare. Mark's also a really good photographer. Not only does he know a lot about birds and is great at outreach and all of those things, he's an exceptional photographer too. And I've seen those loon shots that you take and they look so, so good. I want to um, get on to talking about bird feed because not all of us have bird seed at home. So if we're making our own bird feed, what should we do? So I have four different types of food with me right here, and we're going to talk about whether or not they're appropriate. So first, I have popcorn. Next, I have almonds. Next, I have what? Pecans. Those are delicious. And then finally, I have peanuts. And all the, the nuts that I have, they've all been like pretty smashed up. Now, of these type of foods, I wanna know if they're appropriate uh, bird feed. So the first one I wanna talk about is popcorn. Is popcorn good food to, to, for birds to eat? You know, I wouldn't say popcorn is great food. I think if you wanted to use corn or crack corn, that would probably be better for the birds. Um, popcorn is kind of a little bit like bread. It doesn't have a lot of nutrition in it at that point, so the birds really aren't getting a lot out of it. Nuts and seeds are really the best thing for our winter birds. Okay, so big takeaway right there for all of our friends um, is uh, – Popcorn and bread, really not good for uh, our bird friends, okay? So don't be thinking about that. But we do have a good question from our friends at home. What about rice? Now, birds don't eat a lot of rice. I don't think they really see it as a food resource. So, they, you know, if you put rice and a lot of nuts out, you're going to get a lot of squirrels probably, mm. but probably not a lot of birds. Okay. So for my bird feeder, I will be putting in some almonds because that's what we have in our household. I'm just gonna drop those right in there. This is delicious. And these are those like nice chopped almonds that like you get on a croissant, which is mm, delish. Uh, I'm gonna throw some of those pecans in there too. What are some other household foods would you say are good for birds? So probably the best are seeds. So if you have black oil sunflower seeds or niger seeds which are look like a little tiny sunflower seeds peanuts are good blue jays love peanuts but yeah it, you know if you want to get bird seed go to a nature store and ask them for some good bird seed and different birds like different seeds but sunflower seeds are probably the best overall cool i like that we have a great question from our audience right now. What makes a bird a bird? Ah, well, I think most of us know that bird knows has no sex, no mammals. They have feathers. So birds have feathers, and all birds lay eggs. There are a couple of mammals that lay eggs. There's a lot of insects that lay eggs, but for the most part, birds lay eggs and they have feathers. Eggs, feathers, there you go. What makes a bird a bird? Um, okay, so I've made my bird feeder right here. 
So this is one way that you can engage with, um, you know, your bird life outside. But there are other ways too that we can be active um, in science. And you know, you're you're a scientist proper. You know, I an ornithologist. That means the study of birds. But we can also be engaged with science too, with our classrooms, with our families, and that's something called citizen science. I'm wondering if you could explain sort of what that is, and then I want us to talk about the great backyard bird count. Okay, so citizen science, or some people say community science, is this great way to get involved with the outdoors and you don't have to be a professional. You can just be an amateur. You can be doing it on a walk. You don't have to be saying, I have to learn all about my birds first. It's just a great way to sort of get outside, enjoy nature, look at what's around you and start to learn about the world around you better. And it's, it's done in a variety of ways. There are Christmas bird counts. And then there's a really a special one coming up this weekend and it runs from February 12th to February 15th called the Great Backyard Bird Count. And that's a terrible name because you don't have to have a backyard. You don't have to do it only in your backyard. You can do it anywhere it's safe under the COVID restrictions that we have right now. And all you do, <coughs> if you want to learn more about it, Google Great Backyard Bird Count and you can download an app or you can enter your data in and it's so much fun and you'll learn so much and we want everybody to participate so this is not just for ornithologists or other people this is especially important for kids to go out and learn about nature because you guys need to protect nature like we've tried to do in our life and we need you to do it even better than we did because we didn't do the best job I like that. I like what you're doing there. So uh, definitely go check out the great backyard bird count. And to Mark's point, you don't need a backyard. We don't have a backyard where we live. Uh, you have to go outside. And so remember that when you are going outside, that you do so safely, wear a mask, stay within your bubble, uh, like in your family unit, okay? Uh, and make sure there's lots of space. And in the outdoors, there is so much space for everyone to explore and understand birds, okay? Uh, and then check out that app and help scientists uh, conserve um, our wildlife, which brings us to a couple more questions, Mark, because we're having such a great chat today, okay? So nope. we need to conserve our, an our, our birds, our animals. Um, are any penguins endangered? Yeah, a lot of the penguins are endangered. And a lot of our Canadian birds are at risk as well. So that's why this citizen science and people getting engaged and excited about nature is so important. Because if you have kids and adults all care about nature, then we'll be able to help protect them. And a lot of it has to do with habitat loss or food resources not being available or pollution or climate change. There's a lot of things we need help with and we need help from everybody we can get. I love it. And a great way for you to like interact safely and to get a better appreciation and understanding of our wildlife is getting involved with citizen science, with community science and taking pictures. Okay, we do have a lot of great questions here that I wanna get from our chat, okay? So I'm gonna try and give these to you rapid fire. Um, for okay. our bird feeder, can we use salted nuts? Um, you can, but it's probably better not to. Birds get their salt naturally. There's the, the, the thing is, right, is like birds can eat a lot of different things, but should they? And so when it comes to salt, it makes uh, they get too, they'll have too much salt in them, which can be bad. Okay, another penguin question. Do penguins live in groups? Yes, they do. Most penguins live in big colonies. And sometimes those colonies can have thousands and thousands of birds. Sometimes they can be much smaller. Okay, another big question. Why do birds gather together? Ah, oh, good question. So birds gather together for a number of reasons. Penguins do it for warmth, just to, they get some body warmth sometimes. But a lot of it's often for finding food and predator protection. 
So if you're in a big group and someone wants to eat, you're got a better chance of not being the one eaten because the bird's not looking at you or the predator's not looking at you. So a lot of it is predator protection. You have all your friends helping you make sure there are no predators around and, and you're just a little bit safer a lot of the time. That's a really good question. I really like that. We have another question from one of our four-year-old friends. How do birds handle strong winds when they're flying? Uh, you know what? Birds are really good flyers, and that's a good question. Some birds will actually fly with the wind. Some birds will fly against it. And if it's a really strong wind, like a hurricane-like wind, birds will just stay down, low to the ground, and not even try and fly at all. So birds know when they can fly and when it's safe to and how long it's going to take them to get somewhere. So they've thought it all out ahead of time. It's like for us, you know, are we going to go outside in a big snowstorm? Well, let's make a good, you know, call here. Let's make a good choice. We'll stay in and birds will just try and stay away from those windy, windy situations. And we have our final question from our audience. And I saved this one for last because it's about a topic that I really like. Where do birds come from? Hey, birds came from other reptiles. They've evolved essentially from dinosaurs. So that makes them super cool. Even though dinosaurs all went extinct, they didn't really because birds had just evolved from dinosaurs. So birds are dinosaurs in a, in a way. So that's pretty super cool. We actually have dinosaurs in the world with us today. That... And we just have to take better care of them. So if, you know, we always talk about like de-extinction and like, can we bring dinosaurs back? Well, what we're talking about today and how, again, you can get involved with things like the Great Backyard Bird Count is we need to preserve and conserve the dinosaurs that are among us today, okay? That pigeon, that, um, that penguin, um, all the bizarre and incredible, uh, you know, amounts and diversity of birds that's diversity of dinosaurs too. So gotta love it. Mark yep. Peck, thank you for joining us today on the Rom Kids yeah. Show. That was so, so, so fun. Um, we made, and I'm gonna show you right here. We made these, we made bird feeders just out of stuff that you have at home. You can go and hang it out outside. That's a lot of fun. Remember, we're live on Rom Toronto Instagram, Tuesdays at 2 p.m. and on YouTube later in the week. Got another really exciting episode coming to you next week as well. Uh, remember, go Google Great Backyard Bird Counts. See how you can get involved and make sure when you do so, you do it safely so that we can do it again uh, in the years and years to come. Mark Peck, thank you again for joining us and everyone at home and in your classrooms. We had so much fun hanging out with you all today. We'll see you again next week. Bye, everyone. Wear a mask. Stay safe. We love you. Bye, friends. Bye-bye.